Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. A man sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed head, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and they said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you were pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. I'll tell you, the first time I heard that, this scares me. It still scares me to some degree. I'll tell you, what if I think I'm wheat, but I'm actually a weed? That sends chills up my spine just even thinking about that. Last year, I received an email where a person I've known for a long time had this exact same concern. And here's what the email stated. I've always struggled with doubt, but I grew up being taught that once saved, you're always saved. And so my mom said it was Satan trying to make me doubt. My fear is that my faith will lack authenticity if I go through the correct outward actions that I need to take, but if they're still just lacking internal change. I want to be 100% firm in my knowing that I'm a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. I don't want to doubt anymore. I don't want to be scared or ashamed to tell people about God. I want to live a life that pleases Him because nothing in my life is worth hanging on to and going to hell over. That was given to me about a year ago, and I'm telling you, I think every honest Christian has wrestled with those exact questions a few times in their life. Maybe 40, 50, maybe a thousand times. I knew a very strong believer, you guys, Terry Long. If you knew Terry Long, every time I went to visit Terry Long, he'd say, how do I know that I can know? Well, we've just spent the last three weeks talking about salvation. We talked about it from, this was... The idea from the top down, God's view of salvation. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit's involvement in salvation. We took three weeks to talk about what the Father was doing, what the Son did, and what the Holy Spirit is now doing. In verse 4 of chapter 1, it says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So that is a top-down look. But my question is, how do I know right down here? How do I know? So I'm going to give you some indications today of how you know that you're chosen. Open up to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at 15 to 23. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 23, and the title is How You Know. Verse 15. For this reason, Paul is writing still kind of the introduction to Ephesians. He got done talking about the work of the Trinity and salvation. Then he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. 
And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is a deep prayer, and I dare say I rarely pray like this, but we need to understand it. And the best thing I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to take four very clear indications that he talks about to know that the Spirit of God is alive in you. One writer said that in here is basically the first three verses of 15 through 18, he says, are Christian evidences. I'm going to call them four truths of very clear signs you are wheat. There's two of them we're going to find in 15 and 16. I'm going to call the will be truths, meaning they will be true of you. And then the rest of the chapter is the can be truths. If you're a Christian, they can be true. However, all four of these are traits only a Christian can attain. And they, the last two, the can be truths, don't happen automatically. They are acquired over time through asking, seeking, knocking, and finding. And they are the results of Christian maturity in the same way wheat grows and gets ahead of grain. A Christian also matures. And he grows deeper in his faith. So let's begin by talking about the will be truths. If you are a Christian, if you have been chosen, if God's Holy Spirit came and sealed you, as Doug talked last week, there are going to be two clear evidences that are automatically true of you. And we find them in 15 and 16. Listen closely. He says, For this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. If you notice, his prayer begins with thanksgiving because he notices there are obvious signs of new life in people that once were lost and far from the promises of God. Now he sees evidences and he goes to God and he goes, thank you. I see new life. This gets me excited, and they're very clear evidences. Actually, he prays the same thing in Colossians 1.3. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. It's very clear. The good work starts here with number one. When the Holy Spirit enters your life, and, the, and he's working on you, and he's changing you, you will first, foremost, and forever be focused on Jesus. You will first, foremost, and forever be all about Jesus. That's all it's all about. There's no mystery. There's no mystery where your belief lies, no confusion who you follow, and no doubt or denial that Jesus came in the flesh. Verse 15, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, what you're putting your trust in, what are you putting your trust in? In the Lord Jesus. It encompasses the whole thing, the man, Christ, but the king. He's everything. And I've put all of my stock in him. You really believe that he lived on this earth. You really believe that he performed miracles, that he was handed over the Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, that he was buried, and you really believe on the third day he rose again from the grave. You believe it with everything in your soul because the Spirit confirms it. So you could say this, a true Christian needs no convincing to be in love with Christ. I like to say it like this, that it's not vague spirituality, but you're loyal to the king. You're loyal to his kingdom. Your first allegiance is to him. You can't help it. The man Jesus is everything, and I'm not afraid or ashamed to say it. I'm not even ashamed to sing it. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've rescued me from this miry clay, and you set my feet upon a rock, and now I know. And I love how it ends. I love you. 
I need you, though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. Can you sing that and mean it? I really believe if the Spirit of God is in you, that's all you got. It's all you've got. More specifically, you could say this. While other people talk about God, generally God, or boast about how spiritual of a person they are, a true believer simply wants to talk about the person of Jesus. There's no vague spirituality. There is no going back on emotional experiences, trying to tell people what wonderful things you have seen. You don't even try to boast about how obedient now you are to the laws and customs. You are loyal to the king. All I care about is what the king thinks about me. Colossians 2, 16 and 19 says it like this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or Sabbath days. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels or emotional experiences disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God caused it to grow. Actually, look how this chapter ends in verse 22. And God placed all things under his feet. This is Jesus Christ. And appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So, if you truly are a Christian, number one, you don't fall for silly and juvenile ideas of tolerance. You don't fall for it anymore. What do I mean by that? There's this desire, I think, a lot among a lot of uh, Christians say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but if you want to believe in Allah, if you want to believe in Krishna, if you want to believe in a cosmic Christ, if you want to believe in Buddha, fine. No, it's not fine. It's not fine, because I know Jesus, and he's everything. And he's the only salvation, the only name given to man by which a man can be saved. If you just let people believe ignorance, you don't love them because you love Jesus. As one writer said, the Christian is a man who sees and finds everything in his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this brings us to why the name Jesus should mean everything. It all concerns this idea of justification, justified. It's a big word, it's a theological word, but very important. Justification is trying to find that thing, that event, that happening, which allows me, a sinner, to be found fully acceptable before a holy God. Because God is holy. So holy, he cannot look upon any sin. It's kind of like, if you've got a cancer cell in your body, your body rejects it. God rejects sin. He hates it. So, how, let me bring it down to the lowest common denominator. How would you answer this question? What keeps you from spending an eternity in hell? I have found in our current religious climate, people act, number one, very nonchalant about the idea of hell. Hell has become what is a superstition, a belief for simple religious minds. So there's this, if you ask anybody about that, they kind of yawn about it and they say, uh, yeah, okay. And they give what I'd say the go-to answers, why they're probably going to make it in heaven. And there's six. I'd, I think there's a number of them, but I'll, I boiled them down to six. The first one is, you know, I was born into the church, the right family. I was baptized at that church as a little infant. You know, my, my grandma prays. You know what, your grandma, I'll just tell you this. Your grandma's not going to be there when you face Jesus, and he's going to say, why should I let you have eternity? Graham, come here. Nope, your Graham shut out. It's up to you. What do you say? Your birth doesn't matter. Your family doesn't matter. The denomination you grew up in doesn't matter. Your wealth doesn't matter. None of it matters, because sin still bleeds through. It's like a weak little shield. Second thing, people's works. These actions and intentions, I think, make me a good person. 
You know, I, I helped bring down carbon emissions this year. I, you know, I brought my old neighbor some extra eggs from the chicken coop. I didn't have to do it. You know the price of eggs. I'm a good guy. I've never once let alcohol touch these lips. Ooh, 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 so you should go to heaven for that. Way to go. Way to go. Have you ever had Geritol? It's alcohol in there, buddy. Anyhow, <laughs> some people, the comparative goodness... This is the biggie. This is kind of like the biggie. Why should I go in hell? Well, I'm not as bad as, you know what? I'm a lot better than a lot of Christians out there. Boy, I've heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that these days. I'm not as bad as those rotten Christians. And I'm not as bad as Hitler, so I'm in, right? This is a biggie. I call it justification by death. I'm telling you, I've done a lot of funerals, and there is somehow this assumption that because I love somebody who died, they're in. They're in. It's called justification by death. In fact, we have this thing that everybody's in unless they opt out. The only people that don't make it in are the ones that just reject them fully. But you know what? I've done some funerals where people have rejected them fully, and people still think they're in. And you can't say otherwise. You don't want to, but it's weird. This is now, this is a new current culture one. I call it the Marx media and marginalized politics matter. You know, I help the marginalized because I help the marginalized. I care more about things. And it's really, we live in a weird day and age where equity is the most important thing. Why am I on this earth? We're going to find out in a second. I'm not on this earth for money and equal status. I'm on this earth for a whole different thing. If that's all I'm on this earth for, for money, what, what's eternity? I don't get it. Well, I'm justified by one thing. Jesus. Jesus. When I say to the Father, why, why should you let me in? Because I believe Jesus' blood covers my sin and he's cloaked me with his righteousness and I'm in him. The Father will say, come on in. And because Jesus is the only one that can do that, I love him. It's as simple as that. Second thing, this is where it gets a little toasty I think the next one's going to be toasty it seems so easy but so the first one how do you know that you know that God chose you you just love him you really do I, I don't want to go any farther than that actually because I'm we're it's like we're ashamed to talk about him he's the everything I got but the second one is more precarious it's going to be tougher for many of you let's keep reading verse 15 for this reason ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord and your love for all God's people. Second quality is you are genuinely committed to his people, to the church. Jesus even said, they will know you are Christians by your love for one another you will begin to realize that the church is loved by Jesus. It is his community, his called out people, his family. And he's never really intended for there to be an independent Christian, a guy who sneaks in and sneaks out. Like Don Henley would say, Desperado, why don't you come to your senses? You've been out riding fences for too long now. Put your hard one. Come on back. Come to the family. You belong. That's the point. I look at it like this. When God's spirit starts working on and in you, being a part of his body will start to weigh heavy on you. You could say it like this. Being part of God's family means I'm responsible for the growth of his body in this location. I am. I am an integral part. I'm part of the body. You'll feel responsible for it. So somebody will say, okay, so what do you say to the person who says, I love Jesus, but it's the church I can't stand. I love Jesus, but man, no people in the church, I can't stand them. I'd say two things. Then you don't know Jesus. Because he calls his church his what? What is the metaphor he calls his church? His bride. His bride. The other day, it's funny, I, I was uh, talking to my friend. I haven't seen him in a long time. Went to college with him. And he wanted to go to a restaurant with me. 
And I said, I'd love to go to a restaurant with you. I said, just don't bring your wife. I can't stand her. (laughs) That didn't happen, but you get the point. The second thing, if you say, I love Jesus, but the church I can't stand, then you don't have love for family. In fact, you don't understand family. How many of you here are a part of a family? Raise your hand if you've ever been part of a family. Okay, now, this is something I've realized being a part of a family. I have four older sisters and an older brother. And um, I am nothing like them. Like, I am nothing like my brothers and sisters. Really, I'm not. But I'll tell you what, I don't know how to explain it. I'd do anything for them. I'd do anything. Like, my sister Steph would wake up at 6 in the morning and go running. I'm like, I don't want to go running. Steph, I want to sleep in. But if my sister calls me, they were calling me this week about my sister Lara, who is not doing good. And I want to know. I want to know. There's something about family. It doesn't matter if you like them or don't. You'll do anything for them. Why? Because they're your family. And all I'd say, if you're a believer, that is how you'll start feeling about the church. Listen to this quote. I was reading this quote. This is a heavy quote, and this will kind of give a litmus test to where you're really at about the church. The natural man, the man who is not a Christian, the man who is not born again, has no interest in Christian people. He generally dislikes them because he finds them to be dull and uninteresting and narrow-minded. Okay, so I'm going to give you my A slide at this time, and this is where I... Go off, great a second, it's my audacious slide. Before I was a Christian, now, now get this, get this. Before I was a Christian, I was a bartender. I was a rugby player, and I was in a cool fraternity. You put all three of those things together, I was cool. That sounds stupid, but I was cool. I get saved. I was invited to a college career group. I went to this college career group. 17 ladies went, five guys went, and I guarantee you not one of them I ever would have found at my rugby games, in my bar, or at my fraternity. They, were, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have done it, but there was, I was cool, you got to understand, and I come to this, and sometimes Christians aren't necessarily cool, if you know what I mean. I don't know if that makes sense. And I'm looking around, I'm going, do I belong here? I don't know if I belong. I was newly saved, and I still had a little bit of that. I wanted to hang on to that swag a little bit. And I'm looking around and go, man, I don't know about this group. I don't know. <laughs> and then they started talking about God. And I, they know God. And I could not not go. And I didn't care anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? I think what we have done is we are embarrassed by our family. Why? Love them. Aren't we supposed to love them first? Love is unconditional. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love will confront, but we want to be cool. Anyhow, that's just my audacious slide. Hopefully you understand the point. Some of those people, they still contact me, and they know God. One person is way on the mission field right now, gave their life for the mission field. And they brought a lot of people into the kingdom. But they weren't cool, I'll tell you what. In fact, one, <laughs> one was from, a, would go to like, his parents were, they were pastors, they weren't rich, and he'd always come to the, the group wearing stuff from the missionary barrel. Do you know what the missionary barrel is? They had these, used to have these things at church called the missionary barrel. It's basically goodwill for the church. (laughs) And the kid would get his clothes from the missionary barrel. And he'd come in and have his, you know, shoes too big or big flannel didn't fit him. But you know what he did? He went to um, dig wells in Barkino Faso, West Africa, the poorest nation in the world. That's pretty cool. So these were will be true. So if the Spirit of God's in you, and you don't love Jesus, I'd be concerned. If the Spirit of God's in you and the church bugs you, why? It's Christ's bride. Now we're going to go to 
can be truths. I'm going to call these the can be truths of wheat because they're in 70:23. Um, because what you're going to see, Paul's prayer, watch what he says in verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Father, the glorious, may give you. So these are things that need to be desired, prayed for, wrestled for. The Spirit of God has to be active in this. However, only Christians have access to these two things. And I'm going to split them into two main requests, general knowledge and in specific knowledge. General knowledge is going to be found in verse 17, specific knowledge, 18 to 23. These two types of knowledge can only be attained by believers, meaning they only occur for those who have the Spirit of God in their life. And if you really are a believer, if you really are a believer, these truths will appeal to you. They will be, I want this. Even though they may not yet be true, they are desirable, very desirable. But you also will know you don't just get them on the cheap. They're not... You have to want them. So the first one is this, a desire to know God, a deep, deep desire to know God. Look at verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Father, or the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation for what purpose? So that you may know him better. There is, I think, in the heart of a believer, a real desire to know God. But Paul says, I need to pray for the Spirit to make this true in your life. And and in this part, he gives, I want you to notice three things. The goal, and I think the goal of every believer, again, is not equity and to get rich. The goal, the reason we exist is to know Him. This is eternal life, that you might know Him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's John 17, 3. That's our purpose. So in this prayer, Paul's talking about our purpose. He's talking about how we achieve that purpose through illumination of the Holy Spirit. And then when we achieve that person, we are going to see God as he is. Glory. He's glorious. How do you know the Spirit's opened your brain? Because God is glorious. Wow. So you could say this first thing is nothing else. You realize nothing else really satisfies like him. That's why I want to know him. That's really why I want to know him. So I'd say this. Look at what it says. 17, I keep asking God of our Lord Jesus Christ so that you may know him better. Christianity is about knowing God. It's always about knowing God. We don't join the church to get stuff. Faith is not about feeling good, therapeutics. It's not even about being good, actually. Christianity isn't necessarily about being good. Look at how dedicated I've been for all my years, tithing and singing in the choirs. It's really not about that. God saved us so we can be with him forever. So we can be with him forever. Jesus says it like this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they they shall see, see God. As if like that's one of the greatest things you could ever receive. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who are single-minded towards Christ, because if those who are single-minded towards Christ will see God. And it's proposed in such a way as, really? I get this? Wow. Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts about this, that they know and understand me. Whoo! If you're a believer, you'll want this. But to obtain it, you've got to wrestle with God for it. If you want to know how to do it, find somebody you know that knows Jesus and ask him, how did you get to that point? Because what you're going to see, most people who really know Jesus have disciplined themselves to find him. But he also gives us another hint on how this happens. That's why Paul says, pray for the Spirit to help us in this endeavor because we can't see him on our own. So look what it says in verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation combined together is called illuminations. When God opens your mind and you see him. 
He unveils and he shows you. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12 says, The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we've received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who's from God, so that we may understand. And when your eyes are open, you will experience the glory of God. So verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that's how, that's the adjective of those who know God. Who, what is the Father? He's the glorious one. He is the one that shines in light sublime. Jesus 17, 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you love me. And in a sense, I don't know how to explain it to you, but glory is the greatest thing we could ever have. Paul says it like this. I consider the present sufferings not to be worth the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And a true Christian will kind of, their, their appetite will be wet. I don't know how to explain it to you, but when you touch his glory, you don't want anything else. Let me give you an illustration. Moses, basically, this is one of the most interesting things about glory. In Exodus 33, says in 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And so Moses prayed to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. So he wanted to be with God. God replied, I will do the very thing you've asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by my name. So Moses asked for the most important thing. He said, now Lord, show me your glory. That's all you want. And I'm just telling you, if you truly are a believer, how do you know you're a believer? When I talk about this, even though it might not make sense, you want it. And I don't know how to explain it to you, but when you taste his glory, it's one of those things when you're reading scripture or you're praying and something like God reveals himself, but you try to tell somebody they don't get it. But you get it. And he's allowed you into that moment. And it's like that's... God's love is better than life. That's a sign that you know you're a believer. And if you're not a believer, what I've just said is you'll be like, what in the world is he talking about? It's a pretty good sign the Spirit of God's not exciting you. So let's go to some specifics. So I'm going to say these specifics are things that we should never stop seeking, we should never stop wrestling for, because these are things that we want to know all the time. I call this specific knowing. So you have in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order you may, three things, know the hope that you've been called to. So hope, that means, that basically hope answers the question, am I going to be okay? Am I going to be, am I able to make it? And then, the riches of his glory and inheritance in his holy people. This is talking about meaning and really about your life. Is my life significant? Because if you notice, it's about learning about our inheritance, but also we are the inheritance. It's kind of crazy. And then the third thing is just power and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So what we need to do is have the Holy Spirit, Paul prays, that your eyes will be enlightened and know what God has for you. So this phrase, that your eyes of your heart might be enlightened, the NLT says it like this, so your heart might be flooded with light. So that these things will, these will make sense. So most of us deal with doubt, we question, we wonder, am I really going to make it? Am I really saved? Does he care about me? Am I a failure? Am I no good? Is my life significant? Do I have meaning? Go and pray about this because God has answers for you. One writer compared our everyday spiritual condition with having cataracts over our eyes. When you have cataracts over your eyes, you see through a glass darkly. That's kind of how we are spiritually. And so what he's saying is we need the Holy Spirit to take off those cataracts so we can see clearly. Have you ever driven through a rainstorm that just came down? 
like you're driving and this massive thunder boomer comes. It darkens and the rain just pours and your windshield wipers are going like this and your hand grips the steering wheel and you go slow because you don't know if you're going to go off the road or if you're going to hit another car or if you're going to knock in. So you're nervous, you're anxious and then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, the sky clear, it's blue, you can see the road ahead and you can get back up to 85 miles an hour at your normal speed. No word. Life is like this. Satan sends that storm. Darkness descends. Anxiety and fear and insecurity start descending. I can't see clearly. I don't know if I'm okay, if I'm going to make it. And what he says, pray for three things. For the hope of your calling. He who begins a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. If he called you, he will complete it. It's interesting. 2 Peter 2.10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome in the eternal kingdom. Why do most people stumble? Because they've got cataracts. That's why. We get worried and anxious. Are you in the Word? Are you praying? Are you going to God and never stop wrestling? You could say this, that you got to realize you haven't arrived. And you got to also realize you're never going to be satisfied until you have arrived in heaven. It's a constant wrestling match. We have an inheritance. Well, at the same time, we are the inheritance. So you can ask the question, does my life have meaning? A lot of people ask this, am I significant? Do you know, it's really crazy. I, I'd love to go on this forever, but the craziest thing is you and I, so here's how Scripture says it. Psalm 2 says that God chose people to give to his son an inheritance. So God chose people as a gift for his son. Jesus then says in Philippians, he takes us, to conform us into his image so that we will look like the Son and he's going to give us back to the Father as trophies of glory. So you and I are caught up in a mad relationship between the Father and the Son and we are the love gift that was given to the Son and the Son gives us back. So the question is, does your life have meaning? It sure does to God. Like it sure does to God. You aren't just a random clump of cells. You are designed to bring glory to the glorious Father. Do you think he cares about you? Absolutely. That's this idea, this inheritance in his holy people. What an inheritance. And then the third thing it talks about is the power available. But listen to what it says, verse 19. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule, power, authority, dominion. Every name that's invoked, not only in the present age, but the one that comes. So this power is available to us that raised Jesus from the dead. What does that mean? Honestly, I've been struggling with that. Because some people say, you know what that power is? The power is res life. It's I get healed of everything if I just name it and claim it, and I can have everything taken care of. Here's what I think it is. It was funny, because we were going to prayer group. I was wrestling with that all afternoon on Tuesday. went to prayer group Tuesday night, and Chris Paoni read that verse from Ezekiel about the dry bones will live. And it's like, that's what it is. It's the power to raise these dry bones. What dry bones? These dry bones of self-worth. I don't think I have much self-worth. Chris, you're you're my inheritance. These dry bones of ability. I don't know if I can do it. Chris, I'm going to raise to life what you think is dead. These dry bones of circumstances. You don't know the world I live in. I'm failing. God can take anything and raise it from the dead. Well, I was was telling the prayer group, it's probably my favorite story of Jesus. Beside the resurrection, that's probably, that's a good one to have as your favorite. But you remember when Jesus was sleeping on the boat? He's sleeping on the boat. They're in the Sea of Galilee. 
They're just, they're trying to travel across and this massive storm comes in and Jesus is sleeping on the boat. He's got his head on a pillow. And the disciples are terrified. But what's really, really interesting is Peter was the most terrified and Peter knew the Sea of Galilee better than anything. And the storm comes in and you know what Peter says? We're going to die. In his mind, all options are closed. I've got no hope. We're going to die. So he wakes Jesus up. He's probably got his hand right there. And he goes, Lord, wake up. We're going to die. And Jesus probably wipes his eyes. He says, what? We're going to die. So Jesus just steps on the bow and he says, will you just shut up? And the, cl- the clouds scatter and the waves go. Whoosh. Sun comes out and the disciples They say they are in fear. They're not in fear of the storm. They're in fear of the man. Because he can do anything, even beyond your wildest dreams. Peter had no other concept. You are in situations where you've run out of options. I'm not going to make it. Do you know who's sleeping at the head of the boat? Wake him up, pray. He can change any storm and make it go. So one of the most interesting things is there's a verse that says all the promises. Kindy's dry bones live. Every promise is yes in Christ. Every promise is yes in Christ. I want to end with a real quick story. I was reading a book. It's, it's called Fairy Tale. I won't tell you who wrote this book, but it's a good book. Um, and it's about this guy, he's a high school kid, and he lives in a normal town, and he finds this well behind his house that goes down to a different land. And in this different land, it's like a fairy tale land. And he's just a high school kid, and he gets captured by the most evil people in the world, but before he gets captured, he goes running, and he falls in this mud, and he's caked with mud, and he gets caught, and he's thrown into a dungeon. When he's thrown into a dungeon... All of these people are like, there's supposed to be this person that's going to come to save us, but nobody's come. And then this guy, he starts wiping his hair, and it's like blonde, and his eyes start changing to blue, and they start looking at him. And they say, you might be the one. And I think it, it, was, it wasn't intended this way, but I think sometimes we think we're so loaded full of dirt, there's nothing on us. We have nothing for this world, and God wants to pour his glory in us so we'll be changed from glory to glory, and we're going to be the person that has hope for the world. You might think you're just a regular person full of mud, but when you start gazing on his glory, you are changed, and you become his inheritance. These dry bones can live.